what Jesus is saying, I hold this against you. You've forsaken your first love. One of the, the things that uh, I, I find in my own walk really is the, a constant need um, for God to soften my heart, for God to stir my heart. Now, kind of one of the churches I wouldn't have minded belonging to, I, I thought I wouldn't mind belonging to the church of Corinth, because Paul said about the church, who had all sorts of spiritual gifts there, uh, the church of Ephesus, I, I can see certain similarities. Although we're uh, not such a big church as them, he, he, he says to them, I know your deeds. I can see all of the stuff that you're doing. And, and, and in fact, there would have been other people that was able to look at them and say, this is a church that is really doing stuff. He said, I know your hard work. And these were a group of people who were committed to their church, committed to serving God and, and were working hard. I said, I know your perseverance. You've been consistent in your stand against evil. You've been persistent in the things that you do. He said, I've e you've even tested those who said they were apostles. And at the time, there wasn't just the 12 apostles. There, there were others. Uh, Paul and there were other good men, but there were a lot of false apostles. One who seemed to try to make a living by going around the churches with their own variation of what they thought was the truth. And, and the angel saying, it's fantastic. You checked it out. And I believe, I believe in prophecy still alive today. I believe that uh, when somebody shares a word with us, what the scripture says is that we're to test that word. I believe God's word is the unfallible word. And so when somebody shares something with you that they think is from God, that's what we need to do is to, to test it. And uh, the word of God, which uh, I absolutely love, I tell you that word is unfailable. And, and we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of people. I know sometimes you can find, in, in my growing up, sometimes if somebody said, well, God, said this I'll be a bit nervous and think well if they think God said it I must do it but it's a load of rubbish we need to see for ourselves what God is saying and this is what the church was like I mean what it was to be part of that church and not only that they persevered in hardships these were people that their faith had a cost price to it maybe it was to do with they couldn't prosper in their work or they couldn't prosper in their Education, I don't know what it was, but they maybe were looked down on and they were doing all of these things right. But Jesus is saying, I've got this against you. You've lost your first love. And I believe that God wants to remind us uh, ourselves. I was thinking that, you know, with the stuff that's going on, we've got COVID-19 and uh, the pressures of doing the right thing as we look for uh, look out for each other as we look for God to do some stuff. We've got this situation with the lighthouse. What's going to happen in the future for us as a church about leadership, about salt and light, synergy. There's all sorts of things that are going on and, and different things going on in, in our own lives with our families. Now, what I believe is we've got to get this priority right. It's Jesus first. And, and I, I, I tried to think of times in my life and when I could look back to, because what, what um, it says there, and I've got it here, he said, um, look back. Here we are. He said, look from where you have fallen. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. Now, I know for me, when I first became a Christian, uh, I found Jesus as my friend. It was very real to me. Uh, I was a really, really fearful child. So I struggled to be able to talk about it to anybody else. I also struggled for my teens uh, about even at times of my own assurance because I wasn't sure I was being obedient to God. And uh, it, it wasn't until probably around about 19 and I started to witness, started to sort things out. Uh, I, I was involved in an accident. And I'm sliding towards his articulated lorry on the ground. I'm on the ground, that is. And I thought, 
I'm either going to live or going to die. But I tell you what, I wasn't afraid. So I knew, I knew I was saved. And, and God was giving me this desire to, to tell people about Jesus. And uh, it was an exciting time. I, I started to ask people if they wanted me to pray with them, that they could ask Jesus in their life. And I had the privilege of uh, seeing several young people uh, give their lives to Jesus. Now, out of that scary time, I was a bit bullied when I was younger. I had a liking for motorbikes and I discovered, because I'd grown a bit, my hair grew, I put on a leather jacket, that, that people were a bit nervous about me, which was kind of nice after you've been so scared when you're younger. And I listened to this fella called Arthur Blessing. And he was uh, kind of Jesus crazy. I think it might have been called a Jesus freak. And on the back of his jacket, he, he had uh, printed a sign that said, One Way Jesus. And uh, I thought, wow, these Hells Angel blokes are not afraid to put on their back what they think. So uh, I got a pot of paint, stuck my finger in it. And on the back of my leather jacket, wrote, One Way Jesus. And... Uh, for the next few years, I, I carted that around or I had another jacket that was embroidered. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was really important during that time as well. There's a song we used to sing and the chorus went, I just thank you, Father, for making me, me. And I, I, I kind of come to terms with the, the fact that God was pleased with me as me. And I, I didn't, I could come and accept myself, whatever the size was, whatever the strength was, whatever the looks weren't, that, that I, I'm pleased with being John. Because uh, I often used to wish I was somebody else. Spent years wishing that. But I arrived at this point, Father, I thank you that you made me me. And really, it's times I'm suggesting in our life when we remember how much Jesus loved us. I was thinking of the disciples. The first one to be called was um, Philip. And it says that Jesus went and looked for him. And, and he said to Philip, Jesus went and looked for him. And he said, Philip, follow me. And, and Philip, first thing he does is he goes and gets, uh, goes to Nathaniel. He says, hey, Nathaniel, I found the Messiah we're looking for. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. So he says, well, come and see. So he takes him over to Jesus. And uh, as he's approaching, Jesus said, there's a man who's there in who there is no guile. And Nathaniel said, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you when you were under the tree. I know what's going on. And I don't know exactly what that meant, but I totally blew Nathaniel away. It so impacted him. Now, another disciple, he'd been introduced to Jesus the day before by his brother, Andrew. Andrew was one of John the Baptist's disciples who kind of started following Jesus. And then Jesus, after he's got these couple of disciples, goes down to Galilee and he's already met Peter, told him he's going to change his name from Simon to Peter. Says, can I come out in your boat? So by that time, there were lots of people that were listening to Jesus. Don't find long lists of miracles he's done yet. But the message, because he's preaching about the kingdom. And uh, so, so they kind of. Jesus said, well, there's not enough space here. Can I borrow your boat? So he gets in the boat, goes out to sea. You know the story well. And uh, after he's preached, uh, Jesus turns to Peter and he said, uh, <coughs> what I want you to do is I want you to throw your net on the other side of the boat. Peter said, look, Lord, I'm a fisherman. I know the score. Last night, we fished all night, didn't get a single thing. But at your command. And he threw the net out of the side. And they got such a big catch of fish that they struggled to get it in. And, and Peter's response was this, Jesus, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. I, I can almost see Jesus smiling at him and say, it's okay. Come follow me. From now on, you're going to be fishers of men. And Jesus gathered around himself disciples. Now, one that we heard about uh, was Zacchaeus. Um, we, we don't hear anything more about Zacchaeus, but I'll tell you what, Zacchaeus fell in love with Jesus. Zacchaeus, who spent his life being despised, come to terms with a very, very wealthy man, probably a, a millionaire, maybe a multi, in the area he lived. Uh, he, he decided he'd see this fellow Jesus, goes up a tree, and then when this person comes by, he's just blown away because he said, 
Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to come and stay with you. And, and he didn't give away half his wealth. So just remember he's a millionaire, so the poor of that area did pretty well for a while. He, he didn't do it because he earned it. He was so overwhelmed. I reckon that uh, money had been his God, I don't know. But he didn't care anymore because Jesus was his friend. And he decided to follow Jesus. Now, those of his disciples, you know, they followed Jesus. They had three years with him, 24-7. Where Jesus slept, they slept. They, they learned to imitate. When they saw him working a miracle, they went and worked a miracle. He came from Nazareth. And uh, when he preached, he sent the 12 out. They must have sounded a bit like Jesus because they did all that he did. Now, after those three years, eventually Jesus dies. He rises again. But there's one man, Thomas, that's not there in the room when he meets with them. And he says, he said, don't believe it. Unless I can put my fingers in his hand or in his side. And uh, eventually Jesus turns up and, and Thomas says to him, and this is an awesome statement for any who don't believe that Jesus is God. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said this, you're blessed because you see me. But how much more blessed are those who believe who have not seen me? So today, folks, you and I are more blessed than the 12 disciples of Jesus. We are more blessed because we put our faith in him, uh, not through seeing him with our eyes. Now, we come to know him in our hearts. That's the reality. When Jesus comes in, he brings about a change. So I, I'm saying let's think of those times maybe when, when we loved him. And, and what he says to the church is it, it's time to repent. Time to turn back to the way that you looked. You loved me first. Now I'm going to pray a prayer and then I'm going to move on a little bit more into our communion time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, Jesus, that you gave everything for us. And do you want us, oh, you're calling us back into intimacy that's as real as the 12 that saw you. And we ask you, Lord, you forgive us when perhaps work, and that often guilty, we get so busy, we, we don't think about you and we don't put you in that first place. So we ask your forgiveness, Lord. And to repent is to say we're making a choice. We want you to be first in our life. We want you to be first in our family. We want that you, Jesus, are glorified through us individually and through us as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen.